So let's talk about feeling socially awkward. And a lot of folks that are along that BPD spectrum have had this experience. Sometimes they could be walking in public and you hear someone laughing and you immediately assume that it's about you. Perhaps you know you're smart, but you don't truly believe in your gut that you're smart. So you feel as though everyone thinks you're stupid or thinks that you're not smart or you're not elegant or savvy, or perhaps it's that family in the head that I talk about in my other videos. It's that internal speak that tells you that you don't fit in, that tells you that you're an outcast, that tells you that you're this square peg trying to get into this round hole and that you'll be all alone forever because you're so socially awkward, you're so weird, you're so bizarre, all these negative things. And you start to say them to yourself. But what I want you to realize and recognize is that you're not alone in this, that many individuals feel this way. And those with BPD may be in an even greater likelihood of feeling like a misfit or an outcast. And a lot of this can come from your social circle because we populate our social circle with people that kind of reinforce our beliefs about ourselves. And they reinforce, sometimes it's willingly, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious, but they reinforce a lot of our negative and maladaptive beliefs, behaviors, and patterns. And when we talk about BPD, something that is so complex, a real complex disorder, what happens is, is that we do populate our social circle, our interpersonal circle with individuals that maybe they're just like, ah, you know what, that's just Susan. Ah, that's just Dave, you know, whatever it is. And we're not pushed back on to do things differently, to do things in a healthy way. And this is where therapy can be really helpful and you can learn and grow and do all those things. But what I wanna do in this video, we're gonna talk about being or feeling socially awkward and BPD. So we're going to check it out. We're going to get into it, the what, why, and how, and I'm going to tell you how to challenge it. So what I want you to do, like, share, and subscribe. You hit that little bell. So you got the pinky out. You hit that little bell if you want, and comment as well. That's really important for me. I love to see the comments. I love to try to, I try to respond to as many as I can. So let's get into it. Now, first and foremost, what is social awkwardness. If we don't define it, if we don't know what it is, how do we know if we have it? How do we know we're doing it? Well, we don't. So we're going to first discuss those signs and symptoms of social awkwardness. First, feeling stage fright when you have to talk to others. And this is not being on stage, right? It's that sense of great fear and trepidation that uh, I'm going to sound stupid. I'm going to say something stupid and oh my God, it's going to sound, you know, ridiculous and all this other stuff. So, I mean, just, just yesterday I was talking to my students and we're breaking down PTSD and complex PTSD and, and two of my students know a lot about PTSD and it, we were really kind of hitting on some finer points. And I think that, you know, even though I have more years or experience than they do, they have great insight. And they brought up something and it really kind of challenged my view of those two disorders, PTSD and complex PTSD. And I take ownership of that because I think we all learn together. And I found myself today kind of thinking, boy, you know, maybe they think I'm an idiot, you know, but even, and that happens to me. We all have imposter syndrome. We all have things that kind of pop up, right? But then I'm like, you know what? Probably not. And if they want to think that, that's okay. I'm going to allow them to think that. I mean, I'm not going to go back and try to repair it or anything like that. If they want to think that, they can. I know I'm not an idiot. Uh, I think I'm a pretty sharp guy. But when we talk about stage fright and we talk about having those concerns, I don't want to be reticent and not talk about my views, even if they're different, or even if I learn something from my students, which I should, we all can learn from each other. I learn a lot from my clients. Absolutely. So we don't want to get in our head and feel this intense sense of trepidation when to talk around others. So instead what we do is we just, we stay quiet and we pull back. Number two, physical symptoms, such as like muscle aches, like you're so tense. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Right? And you're so tense and you're so worried about how you're perceived and are you going to do the right thing? And who knows what the right thing is? And you're just so focused on it and fixated and you feel so tight and, and your jaw is really clenched and you're not sure what you're going to do. So that, and that 
can be a sign or symptom of social awkwardness that you're in those social situations and you feel this intense amount of stress and anxiety and fear. Number three, cold sweats and you feel flushed. And this is something that a lot of my clients actually experience and they do equate it to social awkwardness is that they feel when they're going to meet somebody new, they don't want to say something stupid. They don't want to seem weird or strange or broken or whatever it may be. So they start to sweat a little bit because they're so nervous and then their face gets really red. And when their face gets really like, oh my God, everybody notices, everybody notices and there's something wrong with me. And everybody is like, oh my God, you know, Susan or Dave, you know, that, oh man, they're really anxious. What's wrong with them? You know, but interestingly, most people don't and everybody gets flushed. Everybody gets nervous. It happens, right? But it's hard because that family in the head and that social awkwardness and BP becomes so intense and gets so intense. Number four is that fast heartbeat is that it's going real fast and you're nervous. And these are all those signs and symptoms. Oh my God, you know, am I being socially awkward? Am I worried? All of these things, right? You're starting to notice a trend. We're going to keep going with that trend. And I'll tell you what that trend is at the end. It's that fast heartbeat, right? Is it, oh my God, oh my God. And then let's go to number five, hyperventilation. Is it is hard to breathe and you're like, oh my God, this is really, it's all of this intense social anxiety, all of this intense fear, like number six, having social anxiety. It's having these social anxiety symptoms, big component of feeling as though you're socially awkward. Let's keep going because we're moving and grooving. Now, how about number seven? Number seven is finding social situations difficult to navigate and this can be maybe that you just don't pick up on social situations well. Sometimes people don't. That it's hard to identify particular behaviors or it's hard to think of something clever. If you're the person in the group that's supposed to be funny and you feel like everything you say has to be funny, let me tell you, I think I'm pretty funny. But everything I say isn't, isn't always funny. I can assure you that. And uh, I have some close friends and um, she often tells me that I'm not that funny. Now, of course, she means it as a joke and stuff like that, but... That's funny that she says that I'm not funny because I know she thinks I'm funny because I'm funny. Anyway, so it's that social anxiety component and it's understanding getting lost in those social situations and that they can be difficult to navigate because we're so stuck in our head and that family in the head is turned up all the way and it's so loud and so intense. Number eight, failure to meet other social expectations and social norms. Interestingly about this, is that these are often ill-defined metrics, meaning that you don't know what the social expectations are and you're making an assumption about the social norms. So how would you know how you're supposed to behave, right? I mean, I've never been to a cotillion. I don't know. I assume that you would be real chill and be nice. I don't know. When I'm in those situations, what I do, I'm just nice to everybody. And I like to smile a lot. If you ever see me on the street, you'll notice I'm smiling. I smile at everybody. I don't know, just a smiley guy, right? But when you're in the, what are the social expectations? I don't know, what a cotillion, are you supposed to smile? I don't know, what's the social norm? I don't know. You can try to figure it out, you can learn about it, but if I'm thrown into a cotillion and I don't know what to do, I think I'm just gonna have to be myself and I think smiling is a nice thing to do and say hi to everybody. That's kind of the nice thing to do. But what I could do is the other side of that is blame myself, shame myself about it and say, see, well, you weren't supposed to smile as much. You weren't supposed to say hi to this person. You weren't supposed to say that. You're not supposed to agree with your students. All this other stuff, which is just, it's, come on. I mean, that's just unreasonable. It's not fair. You're not being fair to yourself and you have to do that as well. Number nine, it's feelings of loneliness or being singled out. And that sense of social awkwardness, it gets amplified and reinforced because you feel very lonely and disconnected from others. So because of that, you attribute it, oh, I must be socially awkward, I must be weird, I don't fit in, I'm broken, I'm a misfit, all those things we talked about just a moment ago in this video. And remember that, that those things, that family in the head, it intensifies it. Like number 10, it's being less intuitive around social graces. And that can be knowing when to use manners, when not to, is when maybe you'll, you'll say like an off-putting joke and it, doesn't go over really well, and then you go internal. Then you're talking about blame, brokenness, misfit, all those other things. See, I'm socially awkward. I don't understand the situation. I don't understand the world that I operate in. And what happens is the more anxious you get, the more critical you are, and the more socially awkward you'll tend to feel. Number 11, 
crossing boundaries and unknowingly violating personal space. Now, this can be very, very cultural. So having worked in different parts of the world, giving lectures in different parts of the world, talking with people in different parts of the world, is that personal space is very different than it is where I was brought up, right? So I was brought up in New York. So we're all kind of, you know, squishy. You're getting around. And, you know, so my personal space, I like personal space, but, you know, I can tolerate it. You know, if someone's really close. But in some cultures, people get very close. In some cultures, they don't smile always when you say something funny. Or you know that they're fake laughing. You ever get the fake laugh? You know what I mean? And it can feel like you're crossing boundaries. It can feel like you're violating personal space. We have to look at it from a cultural perspective. But you also have to do what feels right for you. And if you're not sure, try to ask that person what they're comfortable with. And how close is too close? I think that when we don't ask, we don't get information, we start making assumptions. And that's when family in the head takes over. That's when it really starts to manipulate us and add more problems and more anxiety and more fear. And that is absolutely what we don't want to do. Now, recognize that these symptoms, they're definitely confusing. Absolutely. But when we add in BPD or other comorbid conditions like anxiety, PTSD, and depression, these symptoms, they get amplified. They become more intense. Also, don't forget about the negative self-talk that usually comes with BPD. It's that family in the head that makes you feel small, that makes you feel broken, that intensifies that social awkwardness. And those acidic put downs that you say to yourself, like, no wonder you feel awkward. No one likes you. And everyone can see that you're different and weird. It's those kind of acidic self statements that wears away your confidence, it wears away your ability to push back on that negative self-talk. And that's exactly what we don't want to do. We want to empower you to push back and grow beyond your BPD. That's what this channel's about. That's what my books and stuff are about. And that's why you're still watching me. Now, these are painful things, absolutely. And they usually fall into those BPD, beliefs, behaviors, and patterns that perpetuate your BPD and feelings of social awkwardness. Remember, and I alluded to this earlier, that we also build up our life to reinforce our beliefs, our behaviors, and our patterns, whether they're disorder-based like BPD or they could be healthy-based. So what we want to do and adaptive-based, so what we want to do is we want to embrace those things. We want to embrace the ability to grow beyond it. And you might be saying, well, if I have these things, why do I have social awkwardness? Why do I have this? Where's this coming from? What's it all about? Well, Let's talk about it. So feeling socially awkward can come from a lack of confidence, and this can be directly related to your BPD and those self statements. Now, many individuals have developed BPD to grow up in invalidating environments. When you had like emotional reactions, right? When you were a kid and you had emotional reactions and they were met with an out of proportion response or even no response, unless it was extreme on your part, and it was in these environments that didn't allow for you to develop social competence. So you started to question yourself and your worth. And this started to manifest as you feeling socially awkward. And those invalidating environments can be really painful. And they can really add to the confusion and the development of BPD traits, symptoms, and behaviors. Absolutely. So recognize it's that social confidence and how do we build confidence? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Now, many people have written me because in my community on the YouTube channel, so I asked folks what makes them feel socially awkward. And interestingly, they told me a lot of things and I'm, I'm not going to read any of it. I'm just going to kind of tell you just to paraphrase an overview of it. So a lot of times individuals in these situations will feel like that everyone is against them. It's the sense of paranoia. Now remember, BPD, for individuals that have BPD, not our BPD, right? Because we're not a disorder. We have a disorder, remember that. But that when you have BPD and that stress starts to rise, it is common for paranoia to kick in, this sense of fear. And what that can be attached to is then the sense of social awkwardness, that that family in the head starts to tell you, well, you know, Everybody sees how weird you are or 
anything that you say, then you got to rehearse it. And when you rehearse it, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, man, I probably shouldn't have said that. They're going to think I'm stupid. They're thinking I'm not smart. Everybody's out to get me. They're going to take advantage of me. Now, all of that, all of that intensive anxiety and fear and regret and all those things start to build inside. And it can become intense. Also, just as I mentioned, is that social competence, those invalidating environments. So it's not always just your home environment. It could also be that your peers, like other kids, maybe you were the weird kid or people called you weird or you were picked on or you were bullied or things like that. And you still carry those things with you. And if you don't process them out, they stay with you. They become tattooed on you. But just like tattoos, you can get them removed. And yeah, sometimes it's kind of painful, but you can get it removed. And that's what therapy is all about. That's the process of therapy is revisiting these things, unpacking it and doing it differently today and not being stuck in yesterday. Now, another component can be in relationships, social awkwardness in relationships. And it could be that you're looking at others. It could be, you know, men, women, you know, whoever it is, and you see other people connecting to them. And you're like, oh, I just don't have that ability. I don't have that game. I'm not that slick or I'm not able to, you know, form those relationships in that way or even interact quite harmoniously or in an easy and smooth way because you feel so awkward and you're so caught up in your head and that judgment that it makes you feel kind of fumbly. And feeling fumbly only adds and reinforces that view. And it empowers your BPD. It empowers your belief of social awkwardness about yourself. Well, what can you do about social awkwardness? All right, so first, I want you to identify core content and what's driving your feelings of being socially awkward. Is it because you feel or you're afraid that you feel inadequate? Is it the sense of self-doubt? Is it a sense of shame? What's at the core of it? The surface content is the social awkwardness, is all of that anxiety and all of that fear that's involved in it. But what's driving it? Because we got to get to the core. If we don't get to the core, we're not going to be able to deal with it and change it for long term. And that's what we want to do. You want to identify those standard criteria that we talked about that you feel make you feel socially awkward. What are those things that stand out? You could write them down. You could type them in your phone. What are the things that you believe cause you to feel and act in a socially awkward way? Build insight into it. You got to understand it and find the source of the social shame. A lot of times there's components of social shame and you want to reflect on your past and you want to know or revisit if you were bullied, right? Were you belittled by a teacher or even your parents or identify that source of shame that can help you understand why you feel socially awkward in various settings. Next, examine perfectionism. A lot of times we have this belief that life is like a movie or a TV show. It is not. That, oh, you're going to meet somebody and then there's going to be a little bit of turmoil, a little misunderstanding, and then everything's going to click and then it's going to be happily ever after. That is a perfectionistic view. That you're going to have this, then this, and then this, then happily ever after. It's very common for folks to believe that and have that conception. But that is a degree of perfectionism. And also understand that you don't need to be perfect. You just need to be yourself. We have to accept ourselves for where we are and what our skill set is. Not everybody is socially savvy. I'm not always socially savvy. Sometimes I'm sure I might be a little obnoxious. People in my life have called me obnoxious a time or two. It happens. That's okay, right? Because you brush it off, you learn from it, and it helps to be a little more socially savvy in other situations. Because we live through experience. So you want to align your actions with your true self. And what that can do is that can make you feel more approachable and easier to be around because you're more relaxed. You don't have this perfectionistic standard that when we meet, we're going to have this experience and then everything's just going to work out because it just doesn't work that way. So we have to be open and aware of that. I also want you to push back and stop labeling yourself as socially awkward. The more you tell yourself something, the more likely you are to live it and act on it. Instead, I want you to use the power of your thoughts to be the person you want to be. However, if you really think you're awkward or weird, think about embracing it. Maybe you like comics or maybe you like 
this, that, or the other thing that maybe, you know, the general populace doesn't. I don't know. But embrace that. Make that about who you are and what you like. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you socially awkward. It makes you interested in a particular thing. And that's okay. If it's not hurting anybody else, that's okay. Also, you want to learn to read body language as best you can. This can be really tricky, but you want to learn to recognize particular gestures, facial expressions, or nonverbal cues, right? So that you can relate to someone's sentiment and respond more efficiently or accurately and accordingly. Now, if you're not sure how to do this, there's a lot of mental health providers can help teach you about social skills training. That can be a huge benefit. That can make you build that sense of, of social confidence. We want to do that for you as well. Also, if you're going to meet some folks and engage with folks, have some engaging questions ready. And I, I have a friend and she does it. She is a fantastic conversationalist. But when she meets a group or she knows she's going to meet somebody new, it's like, okay, I got to think of three good questions that I can ask them about themselves. And it's it, it really, I mean, she does it out of the goodness of her heart. She's not being manipulative. She's not trying to trick anybody. She's trying to learn about them. And what happens is that people connect to her because she has a genuine drive to connect to others. It's wonderful. And it's a good way to take the focus off of yourself. And when you formulate these open-ended questions, it elicits someone else to engage with you and carry on a conversation in an easier way. And that's absolutely what, what you want. An example could be, who's your hero, your favorite superhero? If you could live anywhere, where would it be? What is your biggest fear, favorite cookie, place to eat, whatever it is? Ask a lot of those questions. And I know that folks with BPD hate small talk a lot of times. They're like, oh, I hate that. It feels so fake. Why does that have to be fake? To know that what someone's favorite cookie is or to know where they like to eat or know their favorite food or to know their favorite movie or their favorite. That's just learning about somebody. And that's part of the process of building social confidence, knowing that I can engage with you, know that I can interact with you in a way that we can click and connect. And accept that it's okay to feel embarrassed sometimes because it's going to happen. Dealing with embarrassment is part of the human experience. That's totally normal. And learning to cope with it can give you strength and drive to address what you can, to address the factors and issues as best you can. Remember, it, it's okay. Everybody gets embarrassed. Everybody says something, you know, they're like, should I have said that? You know, if there's no malicious intent, then it's a genuine mistake, if it's a mistake at all. You just said it your way. Maybe it worked out. Maybe it didn't. And lastly, talking to a mental health provider can be really helpful because talking to a therapist is another way to learn skills that may help you deal with underlying issues, those invalidating environments, the history of being bullied, and perhaps all of those origination experiences that caused you or drove your building of these maladaptive beliefs, behaviors, and patterns that help to form BPD traits or BPD the full disorder. I hope you found this helpful. Please like, share, and subscribe. Comment too. Hit that bell if you want. And I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.